Hello, welcome to The Baby Historian. In part one of this series, I covered the reproductive history and childcare strategies of Jane Austen's parents. In this part, I will show that Jane's attitudes about marriage were shaped not by her desire to become a published author, but by her observations of motherhood, particularly the annual rounds of pregnancy and childbirth. Unwilling to accept the risks and sacrifices thereof, she set her standards for a spouse so high that they prevented her from marrying, but not necessarily from becoming a mother. I've broken part two down into five categories, marriage, pregnancy, childbirth, mothering, and how Jane became a mother. I had originally planned to do this as one big video, but to do justice to each of the subjects and to prevent me from losing my mind, uh, each part is going to have its own video. This part will focus on the subject of pregnancy. These videos will contain 200 plus year old novel spoilers, as well as discussions of maternal and infant mortality and pregnancy loss. But first things first, who is Jane Austen? Jane Austen was an early 19th century English author who published six novels, Sense and Sensibility in 1811, Pride and Prejudice in 1813, Mansfield Park in 1814, Emma in 1815, plus Northanger Abbey and Persuasion in 1817, which were published posthumously as Jane died that year at the age of 41 due to something. Theories range from TB to cancer to Addison's disease to arsenic poisoning. The fact is we don't know. In one of the first letters we have of Jane's, she makes a joke about the number of pregnant Marys she and Cass know. Mary is brought to bed of a boy, both doing very well. I shall leave you to guess what Mary I mean." Unquote. Contraception was considered sinful, and we covered some of this in uh, the marriage video, because the church told them that the first cause for marriage was the procreation of children. but. It was also because having a lot of babies and it being painful and terrifying, even deadly, was part of God's punishment for the sin of Eve. Quote, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Genesis 3.16 from the King James Version. And one of Eliza's Jane's cousin and then sister-in-law's letters from 1797 to Miss Walter, she speculates whether the new Mrs. James Austen, who is Jane's sister-in-law obviously, and James's second wife is pregnant, or as they called it, breeding. Quote, I do not hear that Mrs. James is breeding, but I conclude it is so, for a parson cannot fail of having a numerous progeny. Unquote. Ironically, of the five Austen sons who married, the two who became clergymen had the fewest children, Henry with none and James with three. Most women expected to become pregnant soon after the wedding and to continue having new babies annually. One of Jane's friends, William Chute, received a letter from his childhood friend, Reverend Wiggett, on the birth of his first baby. Quote, I believe she has rather been in haste to make her entrance into the world. For that day, nine months was our wedding day. We have therefore, you see, lost no time." Unquote. Jane's mother had three babies and three years following her marriage. When Jane's older brothers, James and Edward, were married, they began having children immediately as well. Her first nieces, Anna and Fanny, were born in 1793 when Jane was 17 years old. James's first wife died in 95 without another living child. But Edward and his wife Elizabeth had new babies almost annually in 93, 94, 95, 97, 98, 1800, 01, 03, 04, 06, 08. When Frank married in 1806, the schedule of babies was similar 07, 09, 11, 12, 14, 15, 17, 18, 20, 21, 23. And he was an admiral in the Navy and out at sea for long stretches at a time during his marriage. And these dates don't take into account the very likely possibility that these women experienced miscarriages or stillbirths in between the recorded births of their surviving children. Miscarriage and stillbirth can be a tricky subject for historians because a family might experience one or more but not have the pregnancy or birth formally recorded. We often only get hints through letters and diaries. 
There is a hint that Mrs. James Austin may have experienced miscarriage or stillbirth in 1797. I believe she was married in January of 97 because there is Mrs. Austin's letter welcoming her to the family in November of 96 from the marriage video. And then in December of 96, Eliza writes to Miss Walter, quote, has Cassandra informed you of the wedding which is soon to take place in the family? James has chosen a second wife in the person of Miss Mary Lloyd, who is not either rich or handsome, but very sensible and good humored." Unquote. And then seven months later, Eliza again writes to Miss Walter, quote, I do not hear that Mrs. James is breeding, but I conclude it is so, for a person cannot fail of having a numerous progeny, as you've already read. So we don't know what Miss Walter wrote to Eliza prompting this reply, but it seems like there was at least a rumor afoot that the new Mrs. James Austin was pregnant in the summer of 97. But Mr. and Mrs. James Austin didn't have their first baby, James Edward, until November of 1798. And Eliza cryptically hints at some tragedy occurring in a December 11th, 1797 letter. Quote, James Austin has been very near to losing his second wife, unquote. And what's more is Eliza heard this news from Jane while they were both in Bath. Jane was aware of this event, that her best friend's sister had married her brother and almost died because of it within the year his second wife to die prematurely and possibly related to pregnancy or childbirth. We don't know the cause of the first wife's death. So this information casts new light on Jane's letter about visiting Mary the following year before and after she gives birth, which is in the childbirth video, as well as Mary's own experience of becoming a wife and mother, which Jane was observing. And of course, how stories about other women's reproductive experiences were shared between women informally. Sometimes they are shared with tact and concern, and sometimes not so much. Jane had this to say about one of her neighbors in October of 1798. Quote, Mrs. Hall of Sherborne was brought to bed yesterday of a dead child, some weeks before she expected, owing to a fright. I suppose she happened unawares to look at her husband, unquote. First, not funny, Jane. Second, it was believed that a woman's emotional state could cause a miscarriage or stillbirth, or even cause her own death after childbirth by being apprehensive about dying in childbirth during the pregnancy. And on the subject of pregnancy loss, there is the ever controversial issue of abortion. Quote, I am happy to hear of Mrs. Knight's amendment, whatever might be her complaint. I cannot think so ill of her, however, in spite of your insinuations as to suspect her of having lain in. I do not think she would be betrayed beyond an accident at the utmost." Unquote. Jane may have just been teasing her sister, but it's just as possible that Cass suspected their brother's adoptive mother, Mrs. Knight, a widow for a few years at the time, to have lain in, i.e. given birth. Jane disagrees. Mrs. Knight would have just had an abortion, and Lord Brayburn, with all of his Victorian rectitude, thought this is what Jane meant too, as he omitted that second sentence in the original publication of her letters. The trend for very large families was influenced by the royal family. King George III and Queen Charlotte had 15 children between 1762 and 1783. Having a large family was a sign of one's gentility, a kind of conspicuous reproduction. But of course, only if the parents could afford to keep their family in a high standard of living. Once a woman was married, the expectation was that either she was pregnant or she would be pregnant in a couple of months, unless she was barren or the couple was doing something sinful to prevent it. This worldview was so ingrained in people's minds that when Mrs. Austin's sister, Mrs. Cooper, had a two-year gap in pregnancies, Mrs. Austin figured she must be done having children. Quote, My sister Cooper has made us a visit this morning. She seems well in health, but has grown vastly thin. Her boy and girl are well, the youngest almost two years old, and she has not been breeding since, so perhaps she is done. Unquote. I am curious whether Mrs. Austin assumes this doneness was biological or intentional on the part of the Coopers. Contraception may be considered sinful and in some cases illegal, but that doesn't mean people didn't or don't use it. Jane didn't approve of short intervals between pregnancies or an excessive number of children in a family, both due to the financial burden on the family as well as the burden on the body of the woman and the risks to her health and the health of her offspring. Quote, 
She will be worn out before she is 30. I am very sorry for her. Mrs. Clement too is in that way again, and I'm quite tired of so many children. Mrs. Ben has had a 13th, unquote. And, quote, Mrs. Tilson's remembrance gratifies me, and I will use her patterns if I can, but poor woman, how can she honestly be breeding again? Unquote. These concerns weren't unique to Jane. They were shared by many people in society, including her uncle by marriage, Tyso Hancock, Eliza's father. Around the time that Jane's siblings, Henry and Cassandra, were being born, he raised his concerns to his wife about Mr. Austin's, quote, violently rapid increase, unquote, of his family, and is worried of Reverend Austin, quote, finding it easier to get a family than to support them, unquote, especially considering that one of Reverend Austin's children, George, was disabled and unable to care for himself. But in the context of the era, the religiosity and the trend for large families, what constituted an excessive number of children? Deborah Kaplan suggested that most people in the era would have only considered some method of contraception or family planning for healthy couples once the number of children reached double digits. At Northanger Abbey, Jane seemed supportive of families with 10 children. Quote, a family of 10 children will always be called a fine family, where there are heads and arms and legs enough for the number. Unquote. But what church-ordained family planning methods were around back then? Jane Austen advocated abstinence, and of the options available at the time, which included magic and sneezing after sex, uh, abstinence probably was the most effective one. When she heard of Mrs. Deeds having her 18th child, she wrote, quote, I would recommend to her and Mr. D the simple regimen of separate bedrooms, unquote. Jane considered pregnancy an illness, and in real life and in her novels, Jane had a tood about chronic illnesses, and considering the frequency of pregnancies, it would qualify as chronic. Quote, and provided she can now leave off having bad headaches and being pathetic, I can allow her, I can wish her to be happy. Unquote. In a letter, she remarked about the number of ill friends and one pregnant one. Quote, I am sorry to hear of Mrs. Woodfield's increasing illness and of poor Mary Ann Bridges having suffered so much. These are some of my sorrows, and that Mrs. Deeds is to have another child I suppose I may lament. Unquote. One of the first signals about someone being pregnant in a letter is that Jane says they aren't looking their best. They must have a cold. Quote, I cannot praise Elizabeth's looks. They are probably affected by a cold. Unquote. Elizabeth was pregnant five to six months along too. In fact, I suspect that, quote, has a cold might be code for pregnancy. Colds are common conditions, perhaps as common as pregnancy at the time. In this particular letter, I think Elizabeth really did have a cold because then everyone else in the house gets it too. But we also know that Jane loves double meanings. Consider this update two weeks later. Elizabeth talks of going with her three girls to Rotham while her husband is in Hampshire. She is improved in look since we first came and accepting a cold does not seem at all unwell. She is considered indeed as more than usually active for her situation and size, unquote. Her looks have improved. She doesn't seem at all unwell but that pesky cold. And I wonder at the phrase, quote, situation and size, unquote. I'm gonna get into the size issue in a second, but what of the situation specifically? We know that in Austin's era, it wasn't unusual for women to stay active physically and socially into late pregnancy. We have letters indicating that confinements often didn't start until labor did. And Elizabeth had had 10 prior successful pregnancies. So I'm wondering if there was something in particular about this pregnancy that made her situation unique. In another letter that summer, while figuring out transportation home, Jane referenced that Edward didn't want to be gone long, quote, from a very natural unwillingness to leave Elizabeth at that time, unquote. Perhaps he was always very attentive to his wife, or perhaps more attentive during late pregnancy, or perhaps there was something off about this pregnancy that had him concerned, or had them concerned. But another example of colds as code for pregnancy, in a letter to Fanny about recently postpartum Anna, quote, Anna has had a bad cold and looks pale. She has just weaned Julia, unquote. I mean, you got the cold, you got looks pale, and you got weaned Julia. How many hints does she need to drop? Perhaps Anna really did have a bad cold, or perhaps she has a 
bad cold and needs some ginger chews and IV fluids stat. Anna was in fact pregnant with her second child. Jane compared her to a beast of burden. Quote, Anna has not a chance of escape. Her husband called here the other day and said she was pretty well, but not equal to so long a walk. She must come in her donkey carriage. Poor animal. She will be worn out before she is 30. Unquote. In a letter to Cass about Mrs. Frank Austin, who is only a couple of months along, uh, she is more explicit. Quote, F.A. seldom either looks or appears quite well. Little embryo is troublesome, I suppose. Unquote. Some of the symptoms of pregnancy she gathered from her sisters-in-law was that of rheumatism and the general feeling of being sick of being pregnant. About three days before Mrs. James Austin Mary gave birth, Jane wrote, quote, I went to Dean with my father two days ago to see Mary, who is still plagued with the rheumatism, which she would be very glad to get rid of, and still more glad to get rid of her child, of whom she is heartily tired, unquote. While living with her sister-in-law, Mrs. Frank Austin, in Southampton, she wit witnessed her fainting spells during pregnancy. Quote, Mrs. F.A. has had one fainting fit lately. It came on as usual after eating a hearty dinner, but did not last long, unquote. But perhaps the most obvious symptom of pregnancy is weight gain. And Jane certainly seems to have an issue with fatness, but we need to keep in mind that at her, in her time, fatness had a very different connotation than it does now. Today, at least in the U.S., the fattest populations are often the poorest, whereas in her time, the fattest populations were rich. And even then, fatness was associated with excessive luxury, a la the Prince of Wales. And then there was the issue of changing fashions. The more body contouring gowns made advancing pregnancy, and fatness for that matter, much harder to disguise than the more unnatural silhouettes of the previous decades, or centuries really. After a ball in 1800, Jane describes the guest to her sister in a letter. First we have, quote, Mrs. Blount was the only one much admired. She appeared exactly as she did in September, with the same broad face, diamond bandeau, white shoes, pink husband, and fat neck, unquote. And, quote, I had the comfort of finding out the other evening who all the fat girls with long noses were that disturbed me at the first H ball. They all proved to be Miss Atkinson's of, unquote. But in particular, quote, Mrs. Warren, I was constrained to think a very fine young woman, which I much regret. She has got rid of some part of her child and danced away with great activity, looking by no means very large." Unquote. So I'm still not sure if Mrs. Warren was a fat woman who looked pregnant but lost weight, or a pregnant woman who invested in more robust maternity stays. What do you think? So if you're into historical dramas, you'll know that a woman refusing to dance or ride due to pregnancy is a common trope. But dancing and having an active social life was not unusual for pregnant women in this era, again, even into very late pregnancy. So Jane wasn't mocking Mrs. Warren for dancing, only for looking less fat or pregnant than she had previously. In a letter to Fanny, Jane seems to make another fact joke about a pregnant woman, her sister-in-law, once that troublesome embryo was about to get evicted. Quote, Mrs. F.A. is to be confined in the middle of April and is by no means remarkably large for her. Unquote. With so many women having annual babies, regular periods would have been unusual. There was a theory, and I heard this many years ago in some class in the Bible, literary, biblical history, not theology, that the relative rarity of a monthly period and its association with a woman being not pregnant uh, made having a period more shameful or seemingly dangerous than it really was or is. On screen you can see some of the uh, how it's unclean in the Bible, which Jane would have been very aware of. And we see this attitude from Jane about her own periods in a letter about buying flannel, which is generally considered to be uh, that she was buying cloth for her menstrual rags. Quote, I gave two shillings, three pence a yard for my flannel, and I fancy it is not very good. But it is so disgraceful and contemptible an article in itself that it being comparatively good or bad is of little importance, unquote. And maybe she just had an attitude about flannel. But I wonder if Jane wasn't slightly disgusted by bodies in general or just bits associated with sex or sexuality. 
Even naked shoulders at a ball seemed to annoy her. Quote, the melancholy part was to see so many dozen young women standing by without partners and each of them with two ugly naked shoulders, unquote. And consider how that attitude, if she had that attitude, would have influenced her thinking about things like morning sickness, the act of and recovery from childbirth, of leaky breasts and other leaky bits and leakier babies, etc., let alone sexual intercourse. But then again, it, she may have just not liked the current fashions. Five years later, she reported, quote, I learned from Mrs. Ticker's young lady to my high amusement that the stays are now not made to force the bosom up at all. That was a very unbecoming, unnatural fashion. I was really glad to hear that they are not to be so much off the shoulders as they were, unquote. Uh, Jane's impression of pregnancy was that of a loss of control. Pregnancy was something inflicted on wives, poor animals who had no chance of escape, as the expectation was for it to be an annual recurrence. Becoming pregnant and what pregnancy did to women was out of their control and made them sick and fat, exhausted and uncomfortable. And when it didn't end in the heartbreak of miscarriage or stillbirth, its agonizing resolution, childbirth, could be fatal. And that will be the subject of the next installation of part two, what Jane Austen thought about childbirth. If you found this video interesting, please give it a like. It really helps more people see my videos. And if you're looking forward to more, please subscribe so you don't miss out. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Just remember, living room rules, be respectful to others, other commenters, and myself. If you would like to support my work, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. And as always, thank you for watching. Has Cassandra of... Has Cassandra... Ah, I need my mic. Ah! All kinds of problems.